Hi, so this lecture is a wrap up on the topic we've been discussing, inequality, social stratification, and poverty. Why is life unfair? And why do we tolerate so much of it, especially when there are so many more people like this girl in the picture rather than this suit? A small handful of people in the US and globally control the majority of the wealth and wield the majority of influence over public policies that affect all of us. Why does the underprivileged majority tolerate it? Why doesn't it provoke more revolt, even conflict? And so we discussed two main explanations for inequality, the functional model and the conflict model. The functional model sort of holds, these folks would argue, well, inequality is functional. It allows for the smooth functioning of society. Um, people should be rewarded more for working harder. And so inequality is a way to reward those that contribute most to society. Several problems with the functional model of inequality. One, it assumes that those at the top in important positions are there because of their merits, because of their skills. This is a really large assumption that's often not true. Given that money, power, culturally valued rewards, there's a large element of inheritance to this. Um, the functional model also assumes we all start at the same starting point. The distance to the finishing line is the same for all of us, and this also is not true. And one other objection to the functional model is that um, rewards, it assumes rewards correlate with effort. This is also a, a un unempirically based assumption, meaning if you look at the data, it doesn't really hold up. Um, the average CEO earns in one day what it takes the average worker of their company to make in almost 300 days. Is the CEO working harder any given day 300 times harder than any employee in their company? Um, so rewards aren't necessarily proportional to effort either. The conflict model, the other explanation for inequality, uh, and the one we'll be taking in this class, is it, it agrees with the objections to the functional model. Um, and it would take things even further. It would say inequality is not only unnecessary, but it's immoral. And it has robbed society of so much unta untapped talent of the people lower down on the socioeconomic ladder. Um, and so they would say, conflict model, that inequality exists because a small group of people essentially control the resources we all need, structure the policies that govern the world we all live in, and the way that that's structured benefits very few people while the costs are distributed amongst us all. A related phenomenon to inequality is poverty. 40% of the world population, that's nearly 3 billion people, live on less than $2 a day. This has slightly improved since the 90s when over half the world lived on less than $2 a day. And so this increase in poverty correlates with an increase in inequality. I gave three various explanations for poverty. First, poverty as a natural predicament. Um, things like natural disasters, droughts, hurricanes, tsunamis, these weather, this stuff's always going to happen. It's always going to strike unlucky people. And therefore, we'll always have poverty. There will always be poor people um, because of natural causes like disasters. We looked at the problems with this explanation. Remember, natural disasters tend to have a social side. Um, if a hurricane strikes Florida versus the Caribbean, who's going to suffer more, right? Social vulnerability, access to resources, all these other things play an important role in determining that disaster's impact, as well as one's ability to recover. Um, we looked at the example of the Ethiopian famine. A million people died from starvation. Another 8 million were affected. The government said it was due to a drought. The drought started after the famine. Um, there was food surpluses in Ethiopia while people were starving in the countryside. Um, so there are social causes to this. It's not just natural. The convenience of it being a natural predicament is there's nothing we really can do about that. We can't control the weather and therefore we don't really have to deal with poverty if it's a natural predicament. It's not. The second explanation is we have poverty, poor groups exist because they just lack the right economic or technological advancement. And so if we could just restructure their economy to make it grow more quickly or maybe import the right technology like fertilizer or hybrid seeds so that they can produce more food on the same amount of land, um, this will help lift them out of poverty, provide more food, more income, raise livelihoods, technology. 
can indeed save the poor. And this is the position outwardly taken by development agencies like the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, which is in large part controlled by the developed countries, the wealthy countries like the US and a handful of other countries. Um, you sort of saw the World Bank and the IMF in the film T-shirt travels, which we'll touch on in just a minute. Um, this second explanation is also problematic. Uh, for example, we now currently produce 3,500 calories per person per day. That's how much food we produce. Food production rates have actually outstripped population growth rates in the last several decades. So we produce enough food to feed everyone. Um, we don't have a food production problem. We have a distribution and access problem. People don't have access to the resources they need to survive at culturally acceptable levels. This brings us to the third explanation of poverty, which is poverty is a result of inequality. Um, a handful of people control and structure the world we all live in, um, and often they structure it to their own benefit, right? Power differentials between people, this is what causes poverty. Poverty, a, a, a group of people control the means of production, the factories, the farms that we all work for, um, and they in turn control the wealth, the power, and the decision making. Um, this political inequality explanation for poverty, this is related to the conflict model for hierarchy, for inequality. Um, so poverty due to political inequality, and the reason we have political inequality according to the conflict explanation is one group of people has power over another and they use it to their benefit economically. And so it is the political inequality explanation for poverty that we will be taking um, for the rest of this lecture. And so the goal here is to sort of tie together what we've been discussing in terms of inequality, poverty, why do we have it, and tie that together with this film you just watched, T-Shirt Travels, which is a, about a case study in Zambia um, and, and poverty in Africa in general, and also tie it in with uh, the reading that you've been covering for this week by Hartman and Boyce, Needless Hunger, Voices from a Bangladesh Village. And so in both, both examples, the film and the reading, uh, political inequality is the cause of poverty in these examples. And so hopefully you watch the film T-Shirt Travels. It is my all-time favorite of all the films I show in all my classes. It was made in 2001 by Shantha Blohman. And the main question I asked you to sort of keep in mind is, um, why is Africa poor? Why is there poverty here? And this is connected with the broader topic we've been discussing, which is why is life unfair? And so the film looks especially at Zambia and Africa, and essentially they connect um, donations in wealthy countries where we donate our clothing. Where do these donations go? And that is connected to development, uh, the global market economy, and also the question of why do we have really, really rich countries and really, really poor countries? Because the creation of one has resulted in the creation of the other. They are not unconnected. They are inextricably linked, super wealthy countries and very poor countries. Uh, and so the film sort of starts out, she's in uh, Zambia doing research for something else, but she sees all these secondhand t-shirts, t-shirts from America, from the US, all over the village. And so she starts to investigate how this came to be. Um, and so you, you already watched the film. I just wanna highlight a few things for you. One, um, why can't Luca, Luca Matho, the main character in the film, why can't he make it? Um, is he just not trying hard enough? Is, is Luca poor because he's lazy? This is one of the typical taken for granted assumptions and built in ideologies in the US that you hear often, especially on the right side of the political aisle. Oh, people are poor because they don't work hard because they're lazy. This is so far from the truth. Luca works so hard, uh, probably harder than most of us, right? And not to say we don't work hard, but he's working his ass off. Um, there's something else going on between merits and Luca just not being able to pull himself up by his bootstraps. Uh, and it has to do with the way the global economy is structured. It has been structured in a way that limits people's opportunities in much of the developing world. It's also been structured in a way that tends to benefit the wealthy countries. So you're, when you donate your clothing, um, does anyone remember from the film how, what percent of clothing donations immediately don't even get opened, don't even get opened up at say Salvation Army or Red Cross, they immediately go 
into the back to be sold to secondhand dealers for profit? And the answer is 95% of what you donate is not even opened. It's immediately sold to secondhand dealers that sell these, these items overseas for profit. And so why can't Luca make it? One answer is structural barriers. The way the global economic system has been set up, which has interlinked all the different countries, poor and wealthy, has really limited Luca's opportunities and Luca being sort of symbolic for the people of Zambia. And so Zambia had post-colonialism, uh, post-independence, a pretty booming textile industry, meaning they made clothing, they manufactured clothing. Um, but post-colonial situation, um, many of these countries also um, you know, they were sort of left in a mess after colonial powers withdrew. And so they had a textile industry and it was working fairly well, but they also needed money to invest in their economy. Things like infrastructure, roads, um, these things are important to actually moving products, right? Um, consumers, producers, you need infrastructure to actually sell your stuff or get to markets. And so, and, and what I'm about to tell you, this, this has happened um, kind of across the board to developing and underdeveloped countries. The wealthy countries, the US, um, Britain, France, you know, a handful, the, the sort of G7, the top wealthiest seven countries used to be the G8, but we kicked Russia out. Uh, don't worry about that. And so <clears throat> the wealthy countries say, hey, Zambia, okay, you're doing all right. You've got your textile industry, but you need money um, so you can invest in your economy, infrastructure, provide services. Um, you need capital to do that kind of stuff. And so we'll give you a loan, say the wealthy countries. And the wealthy countries do this through two sort of unilateral international monetary agencies, the World Bank and also the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. And so the World Bank, the IMF, which are run by the, the World Bank's headquarters is a block from the White House. So these institutions are essentially run by the U.S. and a handful of wealthy countries. Um, and so they the World Bank the U.S. says, hey, we'll loan you some money, Zambia. You need it to help your economy um, invest in some things you need, infrastructure, roads, whatever it might be. And so we'll loan you the money to do that um, so you can develop your economy. And this will be good for your people, right? Through economic growth and development, this will trickle down to the rest of your people via social well-being. Um, I don't know how much trickle down you saw in Zambia in the film. <clears throat> And so what was instituted? You remember a few lectures ago, I showed you a graph in which the U.S. had struck a balance pretty well between 1942 and 1980, in which the share of income in the whole country going to the top was less than it had been prior or thereafter. I think about 30 percent of total income in the U.S. was going to the top 10 percent. Before that, it had been much higher. And after the 80s, it continues to be much higher. Um, something like 0.08 percent of the U.S. population now owns 60 percent of the wealth. Um, and so starting in the beginning of the 80s, inequality began to increase sharply, not just within countries, but also between countries. It is a direct result of specific global economic policies put in place by the US under, under Ronald Reagan and by Britain under their prime minister, Margaret Thatcher. And these policies are called structural adjustment programs or policies. Um, S, A, that's an A, P's for short, okay? Structural adjustment programs or policies. And again, this was instituted in the beginning of the 80s um, this is the brainchild of Ronald Reagan of the U.S. and Margaret Thatcher of Britain. And you hear people often um, harken back to the economic heyday of Ronald Reagan, especially Republicans. It was a time of economic growth and wealth and success. Um, that's true for some people, but by and large, this is the time period in which the making of super wealthy and extremely impoverished countries really gets going. Um, and so these policies put forth by the wealthy country said, hey, Zambia, we'll give you some money. We'll give you a loan. But if you take the money, you have to follow these structural adjustment programs, these conditions, because we think this will help your economy. And so this is what it was. They give Zambia the money, but Zambia is then required to do several things. One, they have to privatize all industries. So anything that was previously being done by the government, um, like providing infrastructure, building bridges, whatever that might be, privatized. The idea is by privatizing it, um, it'll be more efficient 
Um, this is the same argument made with healthcare in this country. It'll be more efficient um, and, and that'll be good for the economy. OK, what happened is they privatized these different sectors of the public economy. Private investors from other areas came in, bought it and then stripped down the industries and sold off the assets. They weren't interested in privatizing Zambia's industries and making them work. They came in, privatized them, sold them off and left. Um, so that happened. Another condition of the structural adjustment programs was you also need to open up your local markets to foreign imports. You are not allowed to tax or put tariffs on, same thing, foreign imports. Um, the reason for that, the reason we put tariffs on foreign imports, let's just take the US for example, say China's shipping goods over that are very cheap. Um, let's just say rice, um, so it, which isn't something that we they necessarily import over here. So we also grow rice. And so in order to keep our own local farmers, our local economy competitive, we put a tariff on foreign imports. So say the, the Chinese rice coming over was $10, we'll put another $10 tariff on that. This is all hypothetical examples. So that now it costs $20. Let's say the US rice costs about 15 with no tariff. So now the, the effect of the tariff on foreign imports is to keep the local economy and, produ and produce competitive um, by making foreign imports more expensive with these artificial tariffs. Um, Trump did this recently on, on during the trade war with uh, Chinese imports. He slapped a tariff on them. Um, although if, if you listen to his original words, it sounds like he thought he was actually taxing China. Um, tariffs are paid by the people in the country, right? U.S. consumers in this case. OK, so tariffs are good. It protects the local economy. Um, so wealthy countries said to Zambia and a whole suite of underdeveloped countries around the world as part of these structural adjustment programs give you the money privatize your industry and you also need to open your local markets to foreign imports the effect of this was it absolutely destroyed Zambia's local economy who could no longer compete with the flood of cheap foreign imported secondhand clothing that was being sold at a much lower price than the textiles the clothing that they were actually making in Zambia they just local industries couldn't compete they go out out of business. Um, the, quite also, as you know, the effect of these actual policies, the question sort of becomes, who were these actually designed for? Was this actually designed to pull developing countries up out of poverty? Um, or was it designed to continue siphoning wealth into the wealthy countries? Because ultimately, that was the end result. Um, other conditions of the loans will give you the money, um, but not for free. You have to pay interest on it. And the interest rates were like exorbitant, over 100 percent, impossible to ever pay back. Um, so these countries are perpetually in debt because you need to be spending the money, Zambia, on paying back the money you borrowed from us, paying off your debt. Um, you need to slash all your social programs, things like health care or basic education. Um, Get rid of it. It's no longer free for the public. You need to introduce basic fees for this because you can't be wasting money. You need to be spending on paying back the loans. Um, so all of these conditions of taking the money ultimately serve to kind of destroy the local infrastructure and economy um, to the benefit of the wealthy countries that continued to make money off these global economic relations. <clears throat> Structural adjustment programs. Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, the 1980s. And this is when you see inequality again start to increase, and it has been ever since. Um, so again, you know, the, the question is, who, who are these really designed for, these structural adjustment programs? Um, they tend to benefit the already wealthy countries and further impoverish the underdeveloped countries. Um, hopefully you sort of saw some of this in the film. And so again, this notion that people are responsible for their own poverty. Um, they just don't try hard enough. It just couldn't be less empirically based or further from the reality. Um, it's such a taken for granted assumption in this society. And when you find out what's really going on, um, I, I'd say it gives gives call for great shame among some people that continue to pet, perpetuate this notion that people are poor um, because they just don't try. Um, the, the way the system's set up the structural barriers have, play a huge role in this. Uh, sure, yeah, maybe there's a, someone that's in poverty that might be lazy. I can name a lot of people right now that are super rich that are lazy. That's not what causes poverty, right? It's built into the structure of our system, which also makes it really difficult to get out of. So hopefully you enjoyed T-Shirt Travels. Great film. Um, 
one of my favorites. And just as a side note, uh, Ruth, the sister in the film, Luca's little sister, she actually died a couple years after the film. Um, I don't know why I was unable to find out why, but she passed away before really hitting her teenage years. And so what explains poverty in Zambia? The political inequality explanation, right? Um, because people are unequal and this creates poverty. It's related to the conflict explanation for hierarchy, for inequality, right? Because some people, a handful of people control the wealth, the power, the policies that affect us all, and they control it to their advantage, right? When famine occurs, we are not all equally vulnerable. Poorer groups are more vulnerable. Famine might have an ecological base, sort of an ecological cause. It might exacerbate food shortages, but starvation, people going hungry when there's, a, there's food in the country, this has a political and a social cause, right? Um, poverty, famine, starvation, inequality, they're not just results of natural disasters like drought or backwards technology. Um, there's a political and social identifiable causes to these things. And poverty is sort of like a syndrome in the sense that the poor are powerless to change their situation. Um, they're kind of victimized in the global economy and because they wield no power over policies or wealth to change, to gain power, to change policy, um, they, they really can't change the way the system is set up and they become victims in it. Um, something called this uh, social scientist Robert Chambers calls this this idea that poverty is a syndrome and the poor are powerless. He something called the ratchet effect. Um, and so a ratchet wrench, if anyone, I, I'm terrible at explaining it. A ratchet wrench you use to tighten bolts down. So you tighten it down and as you lift it back up, um, it's locked in place. It doesn't as you lift it back up, it doesn't loosen the bolt. Um, because there's a locking mechanism on the wrench. So each time you tighten it, it becomes locked in place, tighter and tighter. Um, even though you move the wrench in the opposite way, it doesn't, it doesn't loosen it. You become locked tighter in at each stage and you can't really get out. This ratchet effect. I'll come back to this in just a few minutes. Um, but, but the point is, again, these people sort of get stuck in these situations and there's not really a whole lot that can be done unless we change the structure of the system. Um, to change this. And so you should have read for this week uh, this piece by Hartman and Boyce, Needless Hunger, Voices from a Bangladesh Village. And the political inequality explanation for poverty is the explanation they take outwardly in this article. Um, the book's out of print, so you read it online. Um, most of the chapters are really small. And so it centers on Bangladesh, specific this village, Katni, of about 350 people. And they sort of introduced the case study. Bangladesh is this really um, fertile country in terms of agriculture and fisheries. Uh, it has really rich soil, warm, humid weather. You can grow 12 months out of the year. Um, the fi inland fisheries in this country, some of the richest in the world. So lots and lots of resources, an ideal climate for growing food. Um, and it's also a very densely populated country. It's only about the size of Montana, but it has 150 million people in it. It's one of the most densely populated countries on the planet. Um, it's also a poor country. The average annual income is a little over $500 per capita, uh, meaning they're, they're basically a subsistence economy. They don't really subsist by wages or cash economy. They do, um, but true economic security is having access to land so you can grow your own food. And so why is it a poor country? And the assumption, uh, the argument that's often made is well, they don't have enough food or resources and therefore there, there's too many people, not enough food, and you end up with poverty and hunger. Um, and is this true? Are they poor because they don't have enough food or resources? No, absolutely not. It's a paradox. It's a contradiction. The land is extremely fertile. They could pr produce enough food to not only feed the entire population, but probably produce food to actually export it for profit on the market as well. Um, yet you have all these hungry, starving people. And so why? Why is this? And Hartman and Boyce get into the various reasons why. It, it centers on inequality. 
um, resources are distributed extremely unequal and in this case specifically land distribution and so for us our paycheck our job that's maybe our economic security our bank account for the villagers in Katni in Bangladesh land is your economic security without land you really don't have any security um, you might eat you might not because there's all these other factors that start to come into play if you're not producing your own food on your own land um, and so there's lots going on in the article, um, the colonial history, what happened after colonialism and sort of um, changing pa power changes hands a bunch of times. And so I'd just like to highlight a few key points from the case study to sort of illustrate what we're talking about, um, that this political inequality, land distribution leading to poverty and starvation in this area. Um, and so one important thing they talk about is land distribution. Um, prior to colonialism, land in Bangladesh was sort of common property. So all the peasants had the right to till the soil, to grow food on the land. They simply paid yearly taxes to um, nobles that were appointed and called zamindars. So sort of the aristocracy appointed some of their friends probably as zamindars and the zamindars would go around and collect these yearly taxes but again everyone could till the soil um, this was the system of land ownership until british the british came and under colonialism what the british did is they made communal land private property in one swoop they appointed the zamindars the tax collectors the owners they said you're no longer the tax collectors you own all this land that people are using that they're paying taxes on. Um, and so this was good for the British. They sort of gained these allies, um, these local landowners that they gave all this land to. And <clears throat> also were able to make a ton of money off of it um, because the Zamindars, the landowners, were still charging the peasants to use the land. Um, instead of sort of these yearly taxes they collected, the Zamindars started charging rent to the peasants to use the land. So they used to be able to just till the soil, they pay a little bit each year. Now they're being charged rent to actually use the land. And the Zamindars found it much more profitable to just make their money off charging really high rent and not really invest in agriculture or do any farming. Um, so they started making all their money by renting out the land to others. Um, and if you look at land distribution in Katni, again, this is why there's so much poverty, Less than 10% of rural households in the country own over half of the cultivatable land, meaning land that's viable for farming. 60% of rural households own less than 10% of the land. One third of the peasants are own no land at all, uh, meaning they have no economic security. And about 48% of the population is functionally landless, meaning that they own so little land or it's so useless in terms of growing crops, they're essentially functionally landless. Um, the peasants also tend to eat less because they don't have the money. So they are consuming on average about 78% of the calories as their wealthier counterparts. Yet these people are working the fields. They need 40% more calories to do the work. Um, and so the peasants actually grow lots of food, but they don't own any of it. They're working for wages for the landowners or the lenders who are the same person. Um, and the landowner just siphons off the profits and keeps it for themselves. They don't really reinvest in the land or the, pr reproductive, the productive resources. And so the food, the wealth, gets soft, siphoned off at each level by the landowners who the peasants work for if they don't have any land. Um, there's, an, there's sort of one example, uh, another example of exploitation that happens. So um, they, the, there's different commodities, different things that have been grown and sold for export in Bangladesh. Um, don't worry too much about, they talk about indigo and they start growing and selling jute at some point. And jute is the main fiber in like carpet backing or burlap sacks, that's jute. And so the government, um, and we do this with, with our farmers too. To keep jute farmers whole, um, let's say everyone makes a bunch of jute one year, grows a ton of jute, and there's only so many people buying it and it just collapses the price. You, you can't sell it for very much because there's such an oversupply and other people are trying to get purchasers to buy their jute, not yours, so they'll sell it at a lower price. It just drops the price really low. And some people will stop selling jute. They'll switch livelihoods because they just can't make it. Um, but then in later years, you don't have enough people producing jute. 
We do this actually with our corn farmers, and I'll just leave it there because it's a com that's a complex example. So the government said in order to keep people growing jute, which is our main export crop, so jute was how the government's making most of their money, um, we're going to give you a target price so, so that even if the market price isn't good, you can still stay whole. You'll still make enough money to continue on as a jute farmer. Again, we do that. That's what the farm bill is for in our country, although it's become perverse and it doesn't work like that anymore. It just benefits large corporations. This is pretty much what happened with jute, too. And so the government says, hey, you grow jute and we guarantee you at least 90 taka, sort of based off how much it costs to produce the jute, how much money you need to make on it to keep staying in business. We'll give you 90 taka. So Hartman and Boyce go and they're trying to see this actually play out in action. And they go to the government warehouse where these government officials buy the jute from the peasants for 90 taka guaranteed. But what they find is there's no peasants selling to the warehouse owners, just merchants. Um, Yet down the road in the in the markets, there's a bunch of peasants selling their jute, but for much lower than 90 taka, they're selling it for only 60 taka in the towns. Um, why would they sell it for 60 taka in the towns and not 90 to the warehouse manager, which they're guaranteed by government law? And the answer gets back to um, their money siphoning. And so these merchants, these sort of middlemen, um, are buddy-buddy with the warehouse managers, and they make a deal with them. And so Hartman and Boyce start asking the warehouse manager, why don't you buy from the peasants? And, and they say, well, we buy, you know, we would. I don't see any here. Oh, yeah, right. Well, um, we prefer to buy from the merchants because they bring in, you know, hundreds of pounds of jute, whereas the, the peasants come in with maybe one mound of jute or two and so we prefer to buy from the merchants it's more efficient okay but why would the peasants still sell for less down the road when they could come here and sell for 90 and basically what's happening is peasants come to the warehouse the warehouse manager says nope sorry we've already filled our quota for the day we're not buying any more jute peasants come back the next day oh no sorry um come back the next day and they just get the same bullshit excuses every time the warehouse manager refuses to buy from the peasants because what's going on is the warehouse manager has made a deal with the merchants that are buying up all the jute from the peasants in the villages the merchants buy the the jute for 60 taka they then go to the warehouse manager and sell it for 90. the manager and the merchant then take that extra 30 taka and split it and put it in their pockets um and so the warehouse managers always buy from the merchants um, the peasants still aren't getting a decent price for what they're growing, and the money gets siphoned off all along the way. There's also other things going on. Um, because Bangladesh is a poor country, there's a lot of foreign food aid that comes into Bangladesh, um, then and now. But unfortunately, the aid isn't actually going to feed hungry people. Um, they said something like only 14% of the rural poor that food aid is intended for get it. Um, so only about 14% of the rural poor get any of this food aid. And these are the people that can't afford to buy it. That's why we provide food aid. Um, and so <clears throat> what happens is you have others with means, um, sort of the merchants or the Bengali middle class. And as this food aid comes in at low prices, these people with means or landowners will buy it all up and then they hoard it, they keep it until lean times, until there's not a lot of food on the market and then they'll sell it at really high prices. So that's people are still buying the food aid, but it's not getting to the poor people that actually need it, that can't really afford food. And this is a common problem with aid and development projects. Um, outsiders coming in, thinking they're helping, and they're operating in a cultural vacuum, and they often end up doing more harm than good. Um, Hartman and Boyce started to talk about all this, this aid money coming into Bangladesh. Not only is it not reaching the rural poor, it's probably making things worse. It's worsening the level of inequality as, they, as we inject capital into, Bengal, in, into Bangladesh. It's not reaching the poor. It's making the rich richer and the poor poorer. It's making inequality and poverty worse. I'm not arguing we shouldn't be providing aid, but we need to question why we're actually doing these things and what the actual results are. Um, so many non-government organizations, governments, outsiders, the World Bank, the IMF come in, well-intentioned sometimes, sometimes not, but they don't bother to understand the cultural context they're working in. And it just results in tons of wasted effort.
Um, same thing happened in Solomon Islands with non-government orgs coming in to help people after the tsunami. They said, oh, we'll do this and we'll do that for them without bothering to ever fucking ask the locals what they needed or wanted. And you know what happened? A bunch of resources got wasted, not used, and a bunch of villagers were left even more disheartened, more frustrated, more marginalized because they thought help was actually coming and it just made things worse. This, many would say you should hire an anthropologist to go in and do the groundwork. Um, and so even with food aid, there's problems. It doesn't actually reach the people. Um, so another thing they talk about in the piece is, well, okay, if generalized food aid isn't getting to the poor where it needs to be, what if we do specific projects? Like one specific project that goes to a particular group of people, that can't be misused, right? Wrong. They give an example of a tube well. Um, just think um, digging down to get underground water out. And so these tube wells, um, who ends up getting the tube well in Katni? Not the poor villagers, not a co-op, which is what it was designed for on paper. The richest guy in the village got it, Nafis, right? The guy who owns a Japanese motorbike that cost him what it would take one of his workers, one of his peasants working his land, 20 years to make enough money to buy that bike. And how did Nafis get this aid that was meant for the poorest of the poor? Um, corruption, right? He knows people, he knows the aid's coming in. Instead of actually a co-op of villagers applying to get it, he collects you know, a couple of signatures that he made up, talks to his buddy that he knows in the government, and he gets the tube well. Something like a $12,000 tube well Nafis got for less than $300, and the $300 he spent in government kickbacks to get the aid. Um, so even specific projects don't end up making it to where they're intended. And another interesting thing is uh, sort of Hartman and Boyce talk about, well, the, the agencies, the aid agencies say, well, we can't help how the country uses the, the aid. We give them the money or food, but we can't help if they don't use it in the right way. And there's some truth to that. But they also mention when they interview the actual locals, the government officials that are involved in the aid projects on the ground in, Bang in Bangladesh, that these countries, these generous countries like the U.S., they don't just give aid, they give what they are selling. If businesses in the U.S. are making money on fertilizer, guess what the aid is? Fertilizer. If businesses in the U.S. are making money on tube wells, guess what the aid is? Tube wells, right? So it goes both ways. Um, and much of the aid that the U.S. spends is at least indirectly meant to benefit ourselves as well whether that's through military aid to prop up dictators in other countries so that we can continue to take oil out, whatever it may be. <clears throat> and so I mentioned this a few slides ago, this idea of the ratchet effect. Um, Robert Chambers talks about this. So a ratchet wrench, at each, each time you tighten down on the bolt, it locks it tighter into place. And even as you pull the wrench in the opposite way, it doesn't loosen it. It gets locked in tighter and tighter at each step. And so it's an analogy, the ratchet effect, for poverty as a syndrome among some of these people. Um, one study they talk about says for households that own uh, less than an acre of land, each year, because that's not enough land to grow enough food to make it, each year they sell probably half of their land and then half of it the next year um, just to make ends meet until in the end they are landless and they don't have anything uh, and you have people dying on the streets and so there's different vignettes in the piece and I just want to sort of end our discussion on this um, of Hartman and Boyce on this vignette um, it's a good illustration of the ratchet effect I'm talking about at, at each step they get locked in tighter and tighter into poverty Abu and Sharifa live with their six children in a one-room bamboo house with broken walls and a leaky straw roof. They are poor peasants, and year by year, they're becoming poorer. I wasn't born this way, says Abu. When I was a boy, I never went hungry. My father had to sell some land during the 43 famine, but we still had enough. We moved to Katni when he died, my mother, myself, and my three brothers. We bought an acre and a half of land. As long as none of us brothers married, that was enough. But one by one, we married and divided the land. I was young, recalled Sharifa, and I worked very hard. I husked rice in other women's houses to earn money, and finally I saved enough, enough for us to buy another half acre of land. 
But my husband's mother was old and dying, and he wanted to spend my money to buy medicines for her. He threatened to divorce me if I didn't give him the money, so I gave in. The money was wasted. She died anyways, and we are left with less than half an acre. Then the children came. Our situation grew worse and worse, and we often had to borrow to eat. Sometimes our neighbors lent us a few taka, but many times we had to sell our rice to moneylenders before the harvest. They paid us in advance and then took the rice at half its value. People get rich in this country by taking interest, Abu interjects bitterly. They have no fear of Allah. They only care for this life. When they buy our rice, they say they aren't taking interest, but really they are. I mean, a lot of times what happens is that the peasants will need to uh, sell their rice right after it's harvested because they don't have any money they need to eat. And so they'll end up selling it at a lower price than they could maybe get later on. Um, because right after harvest, the market's flooded with rice, so the prices tend to be lower. Then... Um, right before the next harvest, when there's less food on the market and they don't have any food left from their own harvest, they have to start selling off land, borrowing money, doing all these other things to make ends meet till the next harvest. No matter how hard we worked, continues Sharifa, we never had enough money. We started selling things, our wooden bed, our cattle, our plow, our wedding gifts. Finally, we began to sell the land. Today, Abu and Sharifa own less than one-fifth of an acre of land. Most of this is mortgaged to Mohammed Mahazi, a local landlord. Until Abu repays his debt, he must work his own land as a sharecropper, giving Muhammad Hazi half the crop. I can't even earn enough to feed my family, he says, let alone enough to pay off the mortgage. Sharecropping is difficult. When I work for wages, he explains, we at least have rice, and if, even if it's not enough to fill our stomachs. But I don't eat from my sharecropping until the harvest. To plow the land, I have to rent oxen from a neighbor, plowing his land for two days in exchange for one day's use of his animals. In this country, a man's labor is worth half as much as the labor of a pair of cows. When Sharifa can find work husking rice, she usually receives only a pound of rice for a day's labor. Often she cannot find employment. If we had land, I would always be busy, she says, husking rice, grinding lentils, cooking three times a day. Instead, I have nothing to do, so I just watch the children and worry. What kind of life is that? She unwraps a piece of betel nut from the corner of her sari. Without this, we poor people would never survive. Whenever I feel hungry, I chew betel nut, and it helps the pain in my stomach. I can go for days without food. It's only worrying about the children that makes me thin. <clears throat> Soon after our arrival in Katni, Abu fell ill with a raging fever. For a month, he was unable to work. Sharifa husked rice and other households and her children collected wild greens, but finally hunger and the need to buy medicine forced the family to sell another bit of land, three hundredths of an acre. They slipped a little further towards total landlessness. Six months later, in the lean season before the autumn harvest, Abu and Sharifa could not find any work. Again, the family faced a crisis. Sharifa will tell you that she lost her gold nose pin. A neighbor whispered to Betsy, the author. It's a lie. If she had really lost it, her husband would be beating her. He sold it in the bazaar, the market. How else would they be eating rice tonight? The money from the nose pin was soon gone. So one sunny afternoon, Abu cut down the jackfruit tree beside his the jackfruit tree beside his house. He had planted it four years earlier, and in another year, it might have borne its first fruit. By selling it as firewood in town, he hoped to get twenty-five taka. Sharifa and a young son watched as he dug up the roots, which he could sell also as fuel. Do you know what it is like when your children are hungry? Asked Sharifa. They cry because you can't feed them. I tell you, it's not easy to be a mother. She brushed a strand of hair from her forehead and unconsciously fingered the small twig stuck in the hole where her nose pin used to be. Why do you sit here listening to our troubles when people in this country are happy and their bellies are full? They won't listen to tales of sorrow. They say, why are you telling me this? I don't want to hear. Abu nodded. Our religion says that the rich man should care for the poor man. He asked him whether he has eaten. But in this country, a rich man won't even look at a poor man. Sharifa gazed into the fields and mused aloud. They say that Allah makes men rich and poor. But sometimes I wonder, is it Allah's work or is it the work of men? So the ratchet effect. At each step, people are driven further and further into this situation that becomes ultimately impossible to get out of. Um, and so one thing that Hartman and Boyce sort of suggest as a solution is land reform. You need social reconstruction, a redesign of the system, a restructuring of it. And it's the main way that this needs to be done is through land reform. We have to have less private ownership and more cooperative ownership so that 
people have access to tilling the soil um, in a way that's viable. And so <clears throat> what are the takeaways, right? You can inject all the money and capital and aid that you want into a situation, in a, a country, an economy. But if you have not changed the system, the structure of the way the system operates, you haven't changed anything. You have not addressed the level of poverty. You might even be exacerbating it, making it worse. Because if the system hasn't changed and you're injecting more capital into it, the result, as we see in the case study, is the rich continue to get richer and the poor continue to get poorer. Right? Because the system hasn't changed. Yeah. The way that it structures the benefits and the costs of economic growth are extremely unequal. And we can see that. So again, Hartman and Boyce says that to actually even begin to address this, um, A, won't, is not going to solve it. Again, it might just make it worse. Um, we need land reform and social reconstruction. We have to change the structure of the system. So why can't Luca from T-Shirt Travels make it? Why is Africa, a whole continent, largely poor? Uh, why is there needless hunger in Bangladesh from the Hartman and Boyce piece? Right? Is poverty a natural condition, a result of natural circumstances like overpopulation or natural disasters or not enough farmland or resources? Or is it a social condition, right? a result of inequality, unequal access to resources? Um, and this sort of highlights the two main explanations for poverty and world hunger. Um, on the one hand, some would say, oh, it's natural. It's too many people, natural disasters. And because it's natural, we don't really have to do shit about it. On the other hand, people would argue that poverty is a result of inequality, which is a social and political condition. It is created. It is not natural or inevitable. And I think the Kung also provide a good example of this idea that poverty is not inevitable or natural. Um, and so based off what we've talked about, I'll leave you to sort of think about that, a natural or a social condition. Um, what's the cause of world hunger, of poverty, malnutrition? And again, one important reason for these things is structural barriers. The way the system is set up unequally distributes the benefits and costs of economic growth so that very few receive the benefits while many of the rest of us endure the costs without really enjoying the benefits. Um, again, you can inject all the capital, all the money you want into something. If you have not changed the system, you haven't really changed anything. And so where we're headed, our last topic is applied anthropology. We've been talking about inequality, poverty. Uh, in addition to these social issues we face, we face vast environmental problems as well. And so what do anthropologists know? Um, does it matter and can we help? And this is getting at this sort of fifth informal field of anthropology known as applied anthropology. Um, the goal is to use knowledge gained from anthropological research and apply that towards actually solving contemporary human social and environmental problems. 